In this lecture, we'll continue to explore the chemistry of the alcohol functional group. In our previous lecture, we learned that the alcohol functional group can undergo a dehydration reaction. We remove the OH of the alcohol functional group as well as an adjacent hydrogen, creating an alkene. Now we'll talk about oxidation reactions. And in organic chemistry, an oxidation reaction typically refers to a reaction that increases the connections between carbon and oxygen. That may mean creating an entirely new bond between a carbon atom and an oxygen atom, or it may mean increasing a carbon to oxygen single bond to a carbon to oxygen double bond. In the case of the alcohol functional group, we already have an existing bond between carbon and oxygen. The carbon-oxygen single bond is part of what defines the alcohol functional group. When we do an oxidation reaction on an alcohol, there's a variety of products that can result. In general, if we want to represent that we're doing an oxidation reaction without actually being specific about our reactants, we typically write an O or an OXI in brackets. That's a general form that means use an oxidizing agent here. When we do that to an alcohol, we'll take the carbon to oxygen single bond that was present in the alcohol functional group and we'll change it to what's called a carbonyl bond. A carbonyl bond is a carbon to oxygen double bond, which means in the case of an alcohol oxidation that we've removed the hydrogen that was connected to the oxygen. Whatever was connected to the carbon, whether they were R groups or hydrogen, will generally remain although we'll look at specific instances in a moment. As far as the oxidizing agent that's used, it depends on what you're starting with and what you wish to end with. We'll get into specifics of this as we look at different molecules, but a very common oxidizing agent for these reactions is chromate compounds, specifically a chromate compound in the presence of an H2SO4 catalyst. Chromate compounds contain the chromium atom bonded to some number of oxygen atoms. So one of the most general ways to show that is by writing the chemical formula for chromate, CrO3. In the case of an oxidation reaction where we use chromate in the presence of sulfuric acid, we'd write CrO3 along with the H2SO4 to show the catalyst. This is probably the easiest oxidation reagent for us to memorize, although we'll see that there are others as we look at specific examples. Let's start by doing an example of what happens when we oxidize a secondary alcohol. We know that by definition, an alcohol is a carbon single bonded to an OH group. A secondary alcohol means that the carbon will be attached to two R groups. Because carbon has to have a total of four single bonds, that means our remaining bond must go to a hydrogen. If we oxidize a secondary alcohol using chromate in the presence of sulfuric acid, what will happen is we form the carbonyl group. And again, like we did with dehydration reactions, I want to show you sort of a fake mechanism that'll help you remember this. Essentially, we're going to remove two hydrogens from this molecule and we'll take the remaining bonds, in this case the single bond to the oxygen and the single bond to the hydrogen, and we'll combine them together to make a double bond. The result is that our final molecule contains the carbonyl bond, carbon double bonded to an oxygen, the hydrogens have been removed, but the R groups that were attached still remain. Notice that our reactant was a secondary alcohol. The product that we've made, which contains the carbonyl bond, is actually a new functional group. This is what's called the ketone functional group because it contains a carbonyl bond, a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, with an R group on each side. In this case, each one of those R's must be a carbon chain. It can't be substituted with a hydrogen or you actually change the functional group we'd be working with. This is what happens when you do an oxidation of a secondary alcohol. You end up with a ketone molecule. Let's try a practice problem. Draw the product that will result from the following chemical reaction. We have an alcohol and we have chromate in the presence of sulfuric acid. Draw the product that could result. 
To draw the product of this reaction, I can recognize first of all that I'm dealing with a secondary alcohol. I know that because the carbon that the OH is bonded to is bonded to one carbon on each side for a total of two carbon. That means the reaction will also proceed because I have a hydrogen on the alcohol as well as a hydrogen on the carbon. And as long as I have those two hydrogen, I can do this oxidation reaction. The product that results will be a carbonyl bond in the place of the carbon-oxygen single bond. Everything else about the molecule will remain the same. So since this molecule was originally written in a condensed form, I'll still write it in that form for my answer. This would be my final product. This, again, is an example of a ketone. And we haven't learned about ketones yet, but they will show up in the next section, and by then you'll be able to name this molecule as well as draw its structure. Something slightly different happens, although very similar, when we deal with primary alcohols. And the reason has to do with how reactive primary alcohols are. Again, we know that a primary alcohol contains the alcohol functional group, but the carbon in it is bonded to just one other carbon, or just one R group. That means that the carbon must be bonded to two hydrogen. Just like we saw before, when we oxidize this using chromate in the presence of sulfuric acid, we'll remove one hydrogen from the carbon and the hydrogen from the alcohol group. In its place, we'll form a new double bond. That means that the general formula for the product that we make is the carbonyl bond with the R group that was initially attached to it, but what happens on the other side of the carbon is a little bit different. Instead of retaining the hydrogen that was attached to the carbon, we actually end up adding a whole new oxygen atom. So notice how the oxidation of the primary alcohol gives a different product than the oxidation of the secondary alcohol. Again, our reactant was a primary alcohol, but the functional group that results from this oxidation is what's called a carboxylic acid. And as we've seen when we started looking at functional groups in general, the carboxylic acid does contain an OH, but it's different than the OH that was part of the original alcohol. It's important to realize that in this case, we chose to use CrO3 in the presence of H2SO4. And that's definitely an oxidizing agent, but it's what we would call a harsh oxidizing agent, or a harsh oxidizer. As we'll see in the next unit, there are other oxidizing agents or other oxidizers to choose from, and if you choose a different one, specifically one that's weak, we can actually get a different product than a carboxylic acid. We'll save that until the next unit, but be aware that a harsh oxidizer will turn a primary alcohol into a carboxylic acid. Let's try a slightly different practice problem. Is this reaction possible? And if so, what reagent should I use? So take a look at it, pause the video, and decide, first of all, can you even do this reaction? And second of all, what should I use to do it? So in asking, is this reaction possible, which actually is quite a good question to ask yourself when you start a chemical reaction, what you're actually asking is, do I have a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? In this case, my OH group is bonded to just one carbon, so this is a primary alcohol. We know that if you oxidize a primary alcohol using a harsh oxidizing agent, you get a carboxylic acid, which is essentially a carbonyl bond connected directly to its own OH group. So the product on the right is an example of a carboxylic acid you can take a primary alcohol and harshly oxidize it to get a carboxylic acid. This will work. You couldn't turn a primary alcohol into a ketone. That would not work. So if I had drawn a ketone as the product, you would simply say the reaction's not possible, at least not in any simple number of steps. Now, for the second part of the question, what reagent should I use? Well, at this point, we've only learned one oxidizing agent, so I would use chromate in the presence of H2SO4. Later, when we start to learn about other oxidizing agents, in particular mild or gentle oxidizers, you will have more choice of what reactants to use. So there's one other type of alcohol oxidation that we haven't discussed yet, 
and that is oxidation of a tertiary alcohol. A tertiary alcohol is one in which we have the alcohol functional group bonded to the carbon, and because it's tertiary, there must be an R group on each one of these other single bonds. Notice that in each of the previous examples, we removed the hydrogen from the OH as well as a hydrogen from the carbon. In this case, there are no hydrogen actually bonded directly to the carbon because we have three R groups. The consequence of this is that even when you mix a tertiary alcohol with a harsh oxidizer like chromate and sulfuric acid, you get no reaction, often abbreviated by NR. You cannot oxidize a tertiary alcohol, basically because there's no hydrogen directly attached to the carbon, so there's no way for the reaction mechanism to proceed. So watch out for tertiary alcohols. Now I'd like to give you a couple extra practice problems, and in each one I've asked questions a little bit different from what we've seen previously. In this first question, what I'm going to do is give you some reaction conditions and tell you what the product that forms is and ask you what reactant could you use to do this reaction. This type of question is actually very similar to what organic chemists do in their day-to-day -day work because most of the time we know what we want to make and we have to figure out how do we make it. In other words, what reactant should I start with to make the product that I want? Take a second, pause the video, and see if you can figure out what reactant should be used to get this reaction to work. Notice that there are two pieces of information you've already been provided. One is the reagents, or the chemicals that will mix with our main organic structure, and the other is your product. Sometimes it's helpful to think in general terms about what you're working with. For instance, our product in this case is a ketone. And we've only seen one way to make ketones, which can be a helpful piece of information. Another thing that's helpful is to notice that we're dealing with chromate in the presence of sulfuric acid. So we know we're doing an oxidizing reaction. So the question is, what can we oxidize in order to make this particular ketone? Well, in order to create a double bond to an oxygen, I must have started with a single bond to an alcohol. And that, in turn, was connected to the two R groups that we've already established were on that carbonyl carbon. So my reactant in this case was a secondary alcohol. Specifically, it was 3-pentanol, or pentane-3-ol. Let's try one other organic reaction that'll give you a little bit more to consider. In this reaction, I'm going to go back to asking you what products will form. However, this is something chemists deal with all the time, the fact that one reactant can follow a lot of different paths to make different products depending on what you mix it with. So in this case, I'm starting with cyclohexanol, a secondary alcohol, and I'm asking you what will form when I react it with sulfuric acid, but also what would form if I react it with chromate in the presence of sulfuric acid. Pause the video and see if you can draw the products. So there's two products to draw, so you have to remember two different types of reactions. The one that we did in the previous lecture is involving just sulfuric acid. This tells us that we're working with a dehydration reaction. It's not an oxidation reaction because I don't have an oxidizing agent present. So when I dehydrate this molecule, I remove the OH and I allow the electrons that were present to form a double bond. That means my product is cyclohexene, an example we've actually seen previously. In this case, there was no difference between whether I drew the double bond here or whether I drew it here. So I didn't have to apply Zaitsev's rule in this case. Now let's look at the other reaction. This involved the use of chromate in the presence of H2SO4. So this type of reaction conditions indicates that we're dealing with an oxidation reaction. In the oxidation of a secondary alcohol, I'll form a double bond where I previously had a single bond to an OH group. So on this carbon, I get a double bond. These two different products both form from the same reactant, but it depends on what the reaction conditions and the other reagents that were used were. 
This is a classic example of what organic chemists have to contend with. Did you notice that sulfuric acid was the catalyst for dehydration as well as the catalyst for oxidation? That presents an interesting problem because if you don't provide enough of the chromate oxidizing agent or if you don't have perfect reaction conditions, you actually might make both of these products when you only intended to get one. Remember that your textbook has a lot more practice on both oxidation and dehydration reactions of alcohols. To finish up talking about alcohols, I want to talk about the topic of acidity. And the reason is the OH group itself is very slightly acidic. Now we haven't talked about acidity yet in this class because none of the functional groups or molecules that we've been talking about are acidic with the exception of catalysts like sulfuric acid, of course. What does it mean for a molecule to be acidic? Well, a little bit of review from general chemistry will remind you that acidity means that a molecule donates hydrogen to the molecules around it. And there's a lot of different definitions of acidity. You may have run into things like the Arrhenius definition, the Bronsted-Lowry definition, or potentially even the Lewis definition, but both the Arrhenius and Bronsted-Lowry definitions say that a molecule is an acid if it donates hydrogen or releases hydrogen or dissociates from hydrogen, basically if hydrogen can break off from that molecule. In the case of the alcohol group, there is a very slight amount of acidity. That means that when I'm dealing with an alcohol, we always picture it as having the oxygen and the hydrogen attached. However, a very small number of those molecules are actually capable of losing or dissociating from the hydrogen. The consequence of this is that as the molecules separate, the oxygen becomes negatively charged. And at the same time, the hydrogen becomes positively charged. This gives us what's called an alkoxide ion. An alkoxide ion is basically a carbon and oxygen containing ion with a negative charge. The hydrogen ion, of course, can be referred to just by its name. You may also remember that we sometimes refer to the hydrogen ion a little bit erroneously as a proton, but it's something that a lot of scientists do. Most of the alcohol molecules that we encounter will be in the form of R bonded to O bonded to H. Only a very slight, very small amount will actually dissociate or break up. In general chemistry, we learn that we can measure the degree of dissociation and express it with something called the Ka value. The Ka value was the dissociation constant for an acid. You might remember that the Ka values that were very large tended to be associated with a lot of dissociation. Because alcohols don't dissociate a lot, it would have had a very, very small Ka value. The problem with the Ka value itself is that the numbers range very, very widely, all the way from numbers smaller than one to numbers into the tens and hundreds of thousands. For that reason, organic chemists tend to work with the pKa value. The pKa value, just like pH, is a numerical treatment that uses the negative log to change a number into an easier to work with value. So the pKa is actually just the negative log of the Ka value. We don't need to actually do any math with this, but the reason it's important to understand this is this has the reverse effect on values. Because of this, numbers that have a large pKa are actually very bad acids or weak acids or maybe not acids at all. It means they don't dissociate a lot. Meanwhile, molecules that have a very small pKa value are good acids. They donate their hydrogen much of the time, sometimes even all of the time. So how does this relate to the alcohol molecule? Well, we'll talk about this in more detail in a later unit, but basically, because the oxygen is relatively stable with the negative charge, that makes this molecule more likely to be an acid than something that didn't have the oxygen atom. The rest of the molecule structure is just as important. For instance, when dealing with an alcohol, if the alcohol has a carbon chain attached to the OH group, the technical term for this is an aliphatic group, or just an alkyl chain, we're talking about molecules like methanol or ethanol or isopropanol. 
These are the simplest alcohols. And like I said, alcohols are only very slightly acidic. So most alcohols that have an aliphatic or alkyl chain usually have pKa's around 15. It might be just a point lower or higher, but it's basically in the mid-teens. Let's compare that with a molecule that's aromatic. The aromatic alcohol that we've seen specifically is phenol, basically a benzene ring attached to the OH. And as we'll explore in a later unit, that actually does a better job of stabilizing the ion that results when the hydrogen leaves. The consequence of this is that it has a lower pKa and is therefore more acidic. Its pKa for most phenol and phenol type compounds is around 10. If we compare that, however, with a functional group like carboxylic acid, which does have an OH but also contains a carbonyl group, we see that it has a much lower pKa. Carboxylic acids, as the name implies, are much more acidic than alcohols. They tend to have pKa's of around 4. 3 to 5 or 6 is common. For comparison, if we look at an inorganic, strong concentrated acid like sulfuric acid, we would see a pKa around negative 10. So you can see that compared with something like methanol, sulfuric acid is much, much more acidic. However, this acidity plays a very important role in how these molecules interact in aqueous solutions, especially in aqueous solutions like your bloodstream and intestinal tract. Again, we'll get into this in much more detail in later units, but it's a good preview and a good reminder of the fact that these molecules are not static. Even though we tend to draw them in one chemical arrangement, we know that they're able to move and adjust in different environments. This brings us to the end of our discussion on alcohols, and the next lecture will continue looking at molecules that are similar to alcohols, yet contain atoms other than oxygen.